The Earth, one of nine planets which belongs to our solar system. Two-thirds of the surface are covered by a liquid known as H2O. In the following film, we are going to look at a small but very important body of water, the Detroit River. However, to fully realize its importance, we must go back. Back in time, four and a half billion years. At that time, the Earth was in a molten stage, fiery hot. Rivers as large as the Mississippi flowed with hot lava. Huge eruptions threw clouds of dust high into the atmosphere, creating nuclei for raindrops. And soon clouds formed and the rains came, perhaps for thousands of years, cooling the molten mass. During this period, high mountain peaks were eroded and washed into ancient seas. The early Lake Superior was formed this way. For the next billion years or so, seas would dominate the Earth. The same seas that brought forth the first early life forms. On this map of North America, we can get an idea of how these seas cover the land. The southern Great Lakes had not yet been formed, but were simply low basin areas underwater. Gradually, the waters started to recede. However, at the same time, the climate became cooler and cooler, forming ice caps at our poles. Reaching out, expanding toward the equator, these giant ice formations moved. With every mile, a never-ending, gouging, scraping, planing effect. Viewing this map, one can see the approximate course the glaciers took. About 18,000 years ago, due to a warming climate, the last of the great glaciers came to a halt. It then receded slowly for the next 8,000 years and left its icy waters and debris behind to form the huge Great Lakes system. At this point, the ever-changing history of the Detroit River also begins. The year is 1650. We are with the Iroquois Indians about to journey down a body of water not yet known as the Detroit River. Entering the Straits, we pass two islands, one of which will be called Belle Isle. Downriver, the waters narrow. 300 years from now, these wooded shores will be cleared and veined with concrete roads and buildings, giving rise to the fifth largest city in the United States. Going further, we come upon a small tributary. This will be the site of Henry Ford's famed River Rouge plant. Now the waters become shallow and swift. They will be dredged to form the Livingston and Amherstburg channels. Along the river, we notice a few Indian villages. The first white man did not settle here until about 1701 when Cadillac and his party founded Fort Pontchartrain, in time called Via de Trois. By 1756, war came between the French and English, and in 1760, with the French surrender, Detroit fell into the hands of the English. The British rule would be shaky and survive for 15 years only. Much agitation from the French and local Indians, especially Chief Pontiac, made life for the English precarious. 1775 brought the Revolutionary War. Detroit and surrounding territory became a part of the new America. On this map, we can observe the locations of the strip farms which were occupied now by French, English, and Americans. The forts and strongholds of Detroit were located here. Downriver, the opposing forces were residing at Fort Malden.
One more power struggle took place, the War of 1812. At the close of this war, the river became the official boundary between Canada and America and remains the same today. At this period in time, sailing vessels were used extensively on the river and lakes, as shown in these early paintings and sketches of the area. In 1818, the first steamboat docked at Detroit, the Walk in the Water. This event marked the beginning of a long and exciting era for steam-powered vessels on the river. From 1850 to 1900, the river would see as many as 140 craft of various type pass between its shores daily. By 1900, the importance of the waterways was enhanced by the development of pleasure boating. Detroit served as a port for passenger excursions made to and from various locations. Today, the river is one of the busiest waterways in the world. However, much of the glamour and personality vanished with the fading of passenger excursions. This old river has changed a lot since Blanche and I rode on the Tashboe and put in bay boats. We enjoyed the music and the dancing and the picnic lunches on the island. Today, the only major excursions made from Detroit are to an amusement park on Boblo Island, located downriver. <laughs> Opening day always brings back the nostalgia of a past era.
The river is, of course, many things to many people. We've already looked at a condensed history of the area and have taken a glimpse at the excursion era. Now, we're going to look at some specific occupations which owe their existence to the river and its colorful past. The river was the stimulus of commerce, and the development of commerce gave rise to a need for large and diverse types of employment. Through these straits pass ships carrying iron ore, cement, limestone, pulpwood, wheat, and other cargoes. Since the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959, ocean-going vessels bring imports and take out exports. All of this shipping makes the Detroit River one of the busiest waterways in the entire world. A very important service on the river is the Coast Guard. The men in the Coast Guard not only act as water police and rescue squad, they also have the task of marking the great water routes. A ship such as this, which has its base at Detroit, sets out buoys in the early spring and retrieves them in the late fall. This service works in conjunction with the United States Corps of Engineers. The buoys, or markers, are of different size and colors. Each variety has its own duty. Some of the large buoys mark the beginning of channels, a reef, or a shoal. The large cement blocks in the foreground anchor these huge floats to the bottom of the river. The Coast Guard is extremely important to the pilots and captains of these great vessels. Without their service, it would be like driving a car without any roads. Out of a need for contact and communication with the vessels traveling through the Great Lakes grew another service, the Westcott Marine Reporting Firm, located on the river near downtown Detroit. This company helps keep track of the vessels for their owners. It delivers mail and paychecks, marine notices and newspapers, as well as transporting pilots to and from the vessels. As a vessel nears the station, it phones ahead on a ship-to-shore transmitter. Soon, the vessel is spotted, in this case, going upriver. The captain of the little boat, Westcott, prepares to depart. which has already been sorted and designated for this ship, is taken on board the Westcott. Her powerful little engine turns over and carries her out to intercept the oncoming vessel. This is no easy task. 
Since the ship we are about to pull up to is going at a good speed, the Westcott must accelerate to catch up and then maintain the same speed as the vessel. As we butt up against the ship, one of her crew drops the mail bucket. There is a change of pilots on this trip. The pilot boarding will take the vessel as far as Lake Huron and open water, where navigation is not as tricky. pilot getting off has taken this ship from the Welland Canal as far as Detroit. From our level, the ship's deck is very high above us because her hulls have been emptied of cargo. She will be loaded down at some port in the upper Great Lakes and make her journey back down this same route. After the Westcott's mission is through, she pulls away. If traffic is heavy, she will remain out on the river and proceed to service the next ship. On our short trip to shore, we observe the fire station and fireboat next door to the Westcott station. To the city of Detroit, this is another most important service. At the river's edge, fires in warehouses and buildings are difficult for regular firefighters to handle because of the lack of operating space. Here, the fireboat can better function. The John Kendall is the last steam-powered fireboat in the world. It has serviced the Detroit River since 1930 and has the pumping ability of 16 fire engines. On board, we see the pipe fittings through which gallons of water may be pumped. The different size holes are designed for various dimension deck or shore hookups. Compatibility is of primary importance. This compartment holds the nozzles. Again, different sizes have different duties. Now we come to the distinguishing feature of a fireboat, the monitors or guns. These rugged tools have enough power to level a building. This gun is actually capable of powering this vessel through the water by its own hydrojet force. Let's see the ship in action. First, the crew make ready for cast off. The captain throws the Chadburn into standby. This alerts the engineer in the back of the ship. He replies on his chat burn. By this time, the oil burners are fired up and steam pressure is filling the boilers. captain throws her to full ahead. Simultaneously, the engineer starts the rhythmical mechanism. The huge pistons complete their cycle, sending revolutions of power to the prop. Off we go to fight a fire, in this case, a demonstration run.
As we near the scene of the fire, here, the middle of the river, the captain gives the order to... Start the pump, 200 pounds. Okay. The water soars out of the monitor and shoots high into the air, displaying the pressure behind it. This ship has the capacity of pumping 16,000 gallons per minute, or as mentioned before, it is the equivalent of 16 fire engines. This is truly a spectacular sight from shore. The river makes it possible for Detroit to have its own mobile high pressure pumping unit with an unlimited supply of water. Just upriver, another service operates, the railroad ferries. These mobile barges shuttle freight cars back and forth across the river, day and night. The boxcars come to Detroit from all over the Midwest. Here, they are sorted in the freight yards and pushed on to the ferries which will take them to Canada. There, they will be taken off the barge and pulled to their destination. Thousands of tons of freight are transported by rail every day, and due to natural boundaries here, the connections must be made by using water transport. There is an old railroad tunnel under the river, but the ferries transport the bulk of cars from one shore to another. These powerful barges work all year long and are a colorful and present reminder of the amount of commerce which flows between the United States and Canada. Not only service vessels, but pleasure craft take to the river on warm days. Two of Detroit's most well-known clubs are situated on Belle Isle, the Detroit Boat Club and the Detroit Yacht Club. They provide opportunity to relax and get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Out of the interest in motor boating came the spectacular sport of power boat racing and the greatest speed boating figure of them all, the gray fox, Gar Wood. Mr. Wood, shown here in his Miss America 6, won the Gold Cup five times and defended the Harmsworth Trophy eight times. The Detroit River is still the site of these thrilling races and thousands of people line the river's shore to see powerful machines in action. The actual day of the race arrives with the sunrise. The early action is centered in the pit area. The owners, drivers, crew, and relatives are all out to make final preparations for the upcoming heats. The pit crew works frantically right up until the last second to make sure their boat will perform at its maximum. Most of these power boats have more than one engine on hand in case of a failure. It's not uncommon for a change of engines to occur between heats. Needless to say, a good mechanic is of utmost importance. These boats have been on the river for the past week, running their qualifying laps. Today, the field has been narrowed to these final contenders, all battling for the Horace Dodge Cup. Still early in the morning, the spectators start to arrive, not only on foot, but by boat. The harbor master is kept busy, keeping these ships out of the race course. The excitement builds, and before too long, the race begins.
Another event which attracts thousands to the river every July is the International Detroit Windsor Freedom Festival. The highlight of the festivities is a dynamic aerial fireworks display sponsored by Detroit's largest department store. Spectators not only see the fireworks, but also have the opportunity to see the waterfront and skyline majestically illuminated. As the fireworks begin, the entire waterfront echoes with oohs and ahs. For years, the river gave us something we took for granted, water itself. Enough water to keep up our lawns, run our industrial cooling systems, maintain fire hydrant pressure, and most important, furnish us with drinking water. We've used the river for capital gain and industrialization. But what have we put back? We've rewarded the river with pollution. For at least a hundred years, the river has been used as a giant dump. Will we have to pay? We've already started. Though the awakening has been incredibly slow, it is still not too late. If everyone becomes just a little more active, politically and privately, this ugly condition can be cleaned up. From glacier to pollution, this one river has been most important to generations of Americans. It may be said that a country without waterways is like a man without veins.